Okay, well, this is Rick Weitrick again, and I want to welcome everyone back from your lunch and welcome you back to the September 2020 virtual meeting of the National Advisory Environmental Health Sciences Council. So can I have the next slide, please? Oh, John, are you, there we go, nope, there we go, this one. So as I mentioned earlier, this is my first council meeting as the permanent director of uh, NIEHS. So in just in case you haven't heard, uh, let me start off with the announcement from Dr. Collins last June 7th at 10 a.m. So I got a lot of emails from a number of people. Uh, this is all in reference to the new leadership at NIEHS. So all I can say is that it's, it's truly an honor to have been selected as the next director of the Institute. Working under the leadership of Dr. Birnbaum, uh, the Institute has come a long way and I've been delighted to serve as the deputy director and then the acting director of the Institute for almost 10 years. So we developed a strategic plan back in uh, 2011. And we updated the plan a couple of years ago and I was part of those strategic planning efforts. And I feel that the, the current plan that we're operating under still accurately reflects the themes and the goals that will help guide the Institute for the next several years. So I suspect that uh, it would be a, you know, not come to any surprise to most of you, uh, given my, my background in genetics and genomics, that one area of the strategic plan that I'm personally very passionate and very interested about is the need to develop bold and innovative approaches that incorporate individual variability in response to different environmental exposures. I mean, what drives this uh, for me is that you know, individuals with a unique genetic, epigenetic, and biological backgrounds respond to the environment in different ways. So NIH leadership in the OD and Bethesda has addressed this, this issue more broadly as it relates to biomedical science uh, through the Precision Medicine Initiative and the development of the All of Us cohort. So I believe it will be increasingly important to bring environmental exposures to the Precision Medicine Initiative, uh, both for the benefit of NIEHS, our grantees, the environmental health sciences community, and for other ICs and other investigators across the biomedical spectrum. So, of course, as the director of NIEHS, uh, the work of the Institute can't be just about the individual variability. I recognize that we must embrace a broad-based, well, let me pause for a second. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can hear you right. Glad to be certain. There have been a, a Zoom session or two where I've been on talking on and, and I've lost in my audience. So again, let me just emphasize that um, as the director of NIEHS, the work can't be just about individual variability. I recognize that we must embrace a broad-based approach for achieving our goals. That's actually very nicely articulated in our, in our strategic plan. I mean, this is going to require that we bring to bear a focus on numerous areas of science and research from working on better understanding how environmental toxicants impact the fundamental biological networks that drive human biology all the way to implementing our programs and discover uh, disaster research response, the climate change, environmental justice, worker training, super fund related research. So I'm very interested in continuing to reach out to other ICs to continue our work. And what I seem to recall that I think it was Lynn Goldman who referred to uh, my work on this as a as scientific statesmanship. Uh, I've actually enjoyed interacting with other IC directors during my time as acting director. And one of my highest priorities as director is to continue to build strong and fruitful collaborative relationships with other ICs and with other federal agencies. I've always practiced highly collaborative research in my own laboratory, and I believe that true multidisciplinary approaches are exactly what we need to address the complex problems and the challenges that we face within the environmental health sciences community. So overall, suffice it to say, um, we have a lot of work ahead of us and in the end, I'm gonna do my best to bring the type of leadership to the Institute and to the environmental health sciences community that will help to coalesce our efforts together in powerful new ways to address the challenges that we face in the future. So now let me start by giving you an update on, on what's been happening at the Institute since we met virtually uh, last June. So once again, I'll use the framework of our updated strategic plan for my presentation. I've tried my best to limit my oral presentation. It's gonna be 30, 35 minutes. Uh, so hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, I can't cover everything that's in the written report. So I encourage you to take a look at the written report. There's a lot of additional really useful and informative information there for you. 
So let me start by uh, giving you an update on where we are with COVID-19 staff planning at the NIH. This has occupied a lot of our time uh, over the last several months, as I suspect it has for many of you at your institutions. And you may know that the NIH, like many institutions, have been encouraging what we call enhanced telework since the middle of March. So the NIH has, has been open for business, uh, but we're doing everything that we can to manage the extramural portfolio while well, enhanced telework to make sure that the grants get out the door and, and that the money is released and you can continue to do any type of science that uh, you're, able, you're, you're interested in doing. So we have a working group here at NIHS that's co-chaired by Mitch Williams, our deputy executive officer, and Jan Hall, our clinical director. And this working group has been providing guidance to the senior leadership committee as to when it, is in, uh, when it will be safe to bring staff back on campus and how to implement physical distancing and other safety measures to keep staff on campus safe. So last June, management of the NIH developed a plan involving four groups of staff, A through D. Groups A and B involve staff, for the most part, who cannot conduct their work um, using enhanced telework. They can write manuscripts, but at some point, you've got to get back to the bench and you've got to generate data. So we brought group A back on campus in the middle of July, and we brought group B back on campus in early August. So we now have about 35% of our staff, and then for the most part, these are within our intramural research programs. Uh, they're back on campus. Um, and in some cases, we've had to schedule shifts to ensure that the staff that are all working, say, in the same physical laboratory maintain physical distancing, and that there are no more than um, well, people are not crowding together and they maintain at least six feet apart. So at the moment, there is no plan to bring group C and D back on campus. So their enhanced telework will likely continue at least until the end of the calendar year. So when can we bring them back? Well, as uh, Dr. Fauci tells us on a regular basis, we don't know, the virus will tell us when it's time that we can start planning to bring group C and D back on campus. So I'm also very pleased to say that so far there is no documented cases of SARS-CoV-2 transmission on campus and, uh, and I, together with the leadership team, are going to do everything we can to make sure it stays this way. So I'll expand a little bit more on COVID-19 in just a few minutes, talking about some of the science that we're doing in support of this pandemic. So let me go to the next slide. So, as is tradition for the Director's Overview to Council, uh, let me start with some comments about budget. So you've seen some of these numbers uh, at our June council meeting and I wanna reiterate it once again. So after a, co a couple of continuing resolutions, we finally received our FY20 allocations earlier this year. Uh, I wanna call your attention to the numbers in the right two columns. The final NIHS allocation increased our budget by 3.6% to just over $802 million. The Superfund Research Program received a 2.6% increase to bring their budget to about $81 million. So these figures together with the 10 million that we get from the DOE for training uh, brings our entire budget to about $900 million, just short of $900 million. And as most of you know, a good portion of the increase is dedicated to increasing the budget in the extramural division, which is allowing us to maintain the 10% pay line for grants which I suspect is uh, very important for all of you, many of you on the WebEx, uh, on the Zoom session today. So let me go to the, well, let me stay on this slide here. So while I'm on budget, so um, I'm sorry, let me go to the next slide. So let me also touch on the COVID-19 related allocations to the NIH from Congress. So I mentioned this again last June, and I'll reiterate it again. Uh, during the months of April and May, the NIH has received, it received about $3.5 billion above its regular allocation. This, main, uh, this money came to the NIH through three different bills called phase one, three, and 3.5. Don't, don't ask me why 3.5. <laughs> it's uh, the ways of government. Uh, so mo most of the money, uh, as you might predict, has gone to NIAID for therapeutic and vaccine development. Although NIHS did get uh, $10 million in phase one to support our worker training program. Uh, the contributions to other ICs in phase three are currently uh, being used for some of the cross-cutting trans-NIH projects that are being promoted by Dr. Collins. For phase 3.5, there was a $500 million allocation to NIBIB 
And that was to support the RADx tech, that Shark Tank approach for COVID-19 diagnostic um, testing development. And uh, hopefully many of you have seen, if not, I encourage you to get on the NIH website and download it, the press release a couple of weeks ago uh, indicating that uh, a good portion of the $500 million has now been deployed and there are exciting and new and um, high throughput testing technologies that are on the street to help fight the pandemic. Uh, the NCI received $300 million for serology testing and most notably is the $1 billion to the OD in phase 3.5. So Congress put a stipulation that this $1 billion should be for diagnostics. And for the most part, it's you know, for, for testing diagnostics. Although I know that a big focus will be on developing strategies for deploying COVID-19 diagnostic tests and getting them into the communities that need them the most, especially the underserved, under-resourced, rural and other vulnerable communities. Some of the funds will be dedicated to the intramural programs, um, although the vast majority of this funding will be distributed to the extramural community. So I'll talk in more detail about uh, some of these efforts in just a few minutes. So let me just take a couple of minutes and uh, talk about what's happening in Congress regarding FY21 and the NIH appropriation. I should stay, start right at the outset. These are theoretical, um, nothing has passed. So we don't know for certain, but as of right now, the House of Representatives has passed 10 of the 12 annual uh, appropriation bills for fiscal uh, 2021. This is the House. Um, the, pass, uh, the House passed two mini bus packages. The first package proposes a $2 million increase for the NIEHS Superfund Research Program and the Worker Training Program for a total of $83 million. The second package proposes a $59 million increase for NIHS, a one-time emergency $59 million increase for NIHS that would bring the total budget for the Institute to $861 million. So additionally, with the annual transfer of 10 million from the DOA to NIHS, um, uh, this would bring the entire budget for NIHS to $954 million. So if you add up the Superfund, worker training, the DOE transfer plus the NIHL of the labor, uh, labor uh, um, and, and health allocation, it's 954, which would bring us uh, to about a 7% increase for NIHS. So that actually looks pretty good. Um, but I do want to caution your, um, your, your interpretation of this in a couple of ways. The, the, uh, the allocation to the NIH was an emergency allocation, something called Title VI, and would not commit to increasing the base budget. Uh, but the reality is that to date, the Senate Appropriations Committee has not unveiled, marked up, or reported out any of its versions of the 12 annual appropriations bills. So it's increasingly likely that, they can, uh, that there will be a continuing resolution that will be enacted for October 1st. Uh, actually, hopefully we will have that if we don't have budget, otherwise we'll have a government shutdown, and hopefully we can, we can get by without a government shutdown. Um, and so with the, with the continuing resolution, that would require that we operate at the FY 2020 enacted levels. So let me also take a few minutes to comment on some of the deliberations in Congress about a phase four special COVID-19 appropriation. This has been uh, bouncing around in Congress for the past several weeks. And we're actually hopeful that uh, there may be some additional appropriations from Congress to fight the pandemic, but uh, nothing at least currently is certain. So the health and, emer and, and economic recovery omnibus emergency solutions, it's called the HEROES Act. It was passed by the House in July. So this bill proposes uh, about 4.721 billion for the NIH to prevent, prepare for, and respond to your coronavirus. So of this amount, uh, many, of, many of those of you outside the NIH will be interested. Uh, there was $3 billion was allocated for offsetting, quote, offsetting the costs related to reductions in lab productivity resulting from the coronavirus pandemic or public health measures related to the coronavirus pandemic. And there was also just a, a slightly more than a billion dollars was allocated to support additional scientific research or programs and platforms that support research. So what's not clear is how much of this allocation would ultimately make its way to the coffers within our institute, NIEHS. 
So that was in the House. Now in the Senate, the Help Economic Assistance Liability Protection in Schools Act, called the HEALS Act, was released by the Senate Majority Leader in July and would include $15.5 billion for the NIH, divided up to include $12.91 billion for the OD, with $10.1 billion to reopen NIH-funded research laboratories and reconstitute lost research. The rest of the funds would go to the cross-NIH projects, um, the active partnerships that Dr. Collins has, has uh, initiated with many pharmaceutical companies and to various ICs across the NIH. Additionally, interestingly, there, was, uh, there would be a $240 million allocation to target young researchers who need additional research time as postdoctoral candidates because of lost research training due to COVID-19. So very interesting language. I thought I'd just call this to your attention, but uh, I just also want to make you aware of the fact that um, time will tell. Uh, so there have been no movement on these additional allocations from Congress. So best that we all stay tuned. So hopefully we'll be surprised sometime soon. Let me go to the next slide, please. So let me return to the primary focus of my presentation, which is to update you on activities uh, at NIHS over the past several months. Since we use the strategic plan as a living document to guide all of our activities at the Institute, let me remind you that our strategic plan has three themes, which are advancing environmental health sciences, promoting translation, data to knowledge to action, and enhancing scientific stewardship and support. So specifically, next slide. Specific, specifically in theme one, uh, there are several goals that range from enhancing our knowledge of the pathways and defining the pathways and genetic networks that drive human biology to understanding the totality of environmental exposures that can interfere with these pathways and networks, all the way to using machine learning and artificial intelligent approaches to support the new field of predictive toxicology. Next slide, please. So I'm going to take some time now and give you some vignettes of some of the research publications that have come out of our, our two different intramural programs and from the extramural program. So I apologize for the non-scientists and council. I'm going to get a little bit technical uh, over the next few minutes, uh, but hopefully um, you'll have an appreciation for why this is fundamentally important to support the types of research activities that are critical for NIEHS. So I want to start off with describing some of the work in Carmen Williams Laboratory here within the Division of Intramural Research. Uh, Carmen's laboratory studies reproductive biology and is interested in examining the series of developmental molecular events that guide the oocyte, the egg, to embryo transition. And that, uh, that as a result of this tran transition, um, the totipotent cleavage stays pre-implantational embryo arises. So one important developmental event associated with the oocyte to embryo transition is called the embryonic genome activation or EGA, which involves the initiation of transcription from the embryonic genome. So it was not clear prior to doing this work uh, whether and how specific transcription factors like beta catenin, uh, how do they function in initiating the wind signaling pathway, which is, which is known to be critical for the embryonic genome activation. So Carmen and her colleagues developed a strategy to study this problem. And they did this by inhibiting a protein called tankerase, uh, which is a protein that normally functions to degrade axon. And ultimately, it gives rise to a complicated series of molecular events to increase levels of beta catenin within the cell. So they found that inhibition of tankerase using either siRNA or through a chemical inhibitor resulted in a 60% reduction in beta catenin. And this caused a developmental arrest prior to the two cell stage. So in the end, they were able to demonstrate that the tank race activity is essential for controlling the levels of beta catenin in the developing embryo. So overall, this work provides important insights into some of those early molecular events associated with the initiation of wind signaling that are required for the embryonic genome activation. So it's a fabulous, uh, very high profile paper from our colleagues, uh, Carmen Williams um, and her group here in the Division of Intramural Research. So let's go to the next slide, please. I also want to highlight some of the work uh, from Nicole Kleinsteuer's laboratory here in the Division of the National Toxicology Program. 
So as a little bit of background on this, uh, chemical hazard characterization in the 21st century uh, is something we have come to refer to as TOX21. And this has evolved to encompass a large number of high throughput screening research programs, ultimately designed to produce quantitative data on the activity of thousands of chemicals across a multitude of biological targets and pathways, many different cell-based and molecular-based assays. So in the end, the expectation is that the results from these in vitro assays will facilitate a rapid assessment of the chemical hazard and will, and will provide the data to enable predictive computational toxicology using machine learning, artificial intelligence techniques, and human relevant systems biology models. However, the greatest utility of the TOX21 data will be achieved only once there are tools that are available that will allow mapping of the in vitro data onto specific organs within the human body. So this is exactly the work that Nicole and her colleagues published in nucleic acids research that I'm describing here. They did this by uh, combining organ specific gene expression with an expert driven approach. To use the system, actually it sounds pretty simple. Users input a chemical from the TOX21 library and adjust gene expression thresholds as well as the AC50 cutoffs. The result is a graphical display of organ specificity by a specific chemical. So as you can see on this slide, they have developed different data representations that includes interactive tables, activity, uh, activity summary plots, and dynamic networks. So overall, Nicole and their colleagues have developed this powerful new tool to help us to, to really achieve the goals that we've set out using uh, TOX21 data to enable predictive toxicology. So next slide, please. So this, um, the next science advance that I want to highlight is from the laboratory of one of our grantees, Dr. Chuang, Hu, Chuang He. As a little background, it's becoming clear that many messenger RNAs in, in most eukaryotes have methylated adenosines at their number six position, which is something we've come to refer to as M6A. This is an epigenetic mark, M6A. This is something that specifically hits home for me because my major professor in graduate school was amongst the first investigators a few years ago to make this discovery that uh, messenger RNAs have M6As. So more recently, uh, the biomedical research community has come to, to realize that there have been many discoveries that have linked these post-transcriptional epigenetic events, M6A, to the control of a whole host of diverse biological processes which includes self-renewal and differentiation of embryonic and adult stem cells. So in this particular work, uh, this high profile publication, Dr. He and his colleagues used a couple of different embryonic stem cell lines to study the impact of inhibiting several genes that have been identified that function as writers, readers, and erasers of the M6A marks. They made the remarkable discovery that inactivating the writer gene called metal three resulted in an increase in transcription within the cells, a notable increase in chromatin accessibility, and an increase in H3K4 trimethylation and H3K27 acetylation, which are chromatin marks in the DNA associated with active transcription. So how does a mark, you know, the M6A, that is thought to be associated with messenger RNAs lead to changes in transcription? So to investigate this further, they analyzed promoter-associated RNA, enhancer RNAs, or eRNAs, and RNA transcribed from transposable elements. And they collectively refer to these RNA classes as chromosome-associated regulatory RNAs, or CAR RNAs. So what they found is that the level of M6A in these CAR RNAs decreased substantially, and most notably, that the unmethylated CAR RNAs increased in abundance in cells with a knockout mutation in the gene encoding the writer protein, metal three. So this suggested that M6A methylation normally destabilize CAR RNAs. So this is very interesting. So if we thought that it was, if life was complicated at the level of the genome sequence, and then at the level of epi, you know, a variety of different epigenetic marks, you have methylation of DNA, and methylation and acetylation of, of histones, now what we realize is that there, is, um, there are epigenetic events on these regulatory RNAs that are involved in fine-tuning chromatin state and gene expression 
again, through these epigenetic mechanisms. So lots of different things happening in the cell and the environment has the potential to inter interfere with all of those. So let me move on, uh, next slide, please. So let me move on to theme two. So this is about uh, promoting translation data to knowledge to action. And today I wanna to focus uh, most of my remarks on the variety of activities at the Institute related to COVID-19. So next slide, please. So one of the first things I wanna note is that uh, we now have groups A and B back on campus. But before we implemented this, Mitch Williams, Jan Hall, and their working group developed detailed requirements and guidance around physical distancing, hand washing, and, and wearing face masks while on campus. Additionally, and most important, they developed a robust means of asymptomatic testing in the South parking lot. So if you were actually physically here, you wouldn't be able to park in probably a third of the parking lot because there are these tents and People are out there um, gounded up and taking samples for asymptomatic testing. So while it's not mandatory, we encourage anyone coming back on campus to have a weekly COVID test. I do it. I know that you know, many members of leadership do it. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we're very pleased that there has been no case of transmission of the virus while on campus. So let me go to the next slide, please. So many of the staff um, who are back on campus, the 35% of our, of our staff who are working in primarily in laboratories, uh, many of them are doing work related to COVID, um, the COVID-19. So I mentioned last time the work within our state-of-the-art cryo-EM facility to study the structural biology of the spike protein on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I also mentioned the, the really incredibly interesting work um, in our intramural and our extramural communities around developing the pandemic vulnerability index. Uh, and I don't have time to go in and describe all of these different projects, but suffice it, suffice it to say we're conducting a number of other projects directly relating to study the biology of COVID-19. So it's interesting, I think it's noteworthy that our intramural investigators were able to capture about $1.6 million in additional and new funding from Dr. Gottesman's office in Bethesda to conduct this work. And I think it's a real tribute to the quality of our programs and the work that we're doing. NIEHS is, is by far, not by far the, the biggest institute, but we received seven awards, which placed us in third um, of all 27 institutes of centers. So congratulations to Daryl and, and Brian and their colleagues within our intramural divisions for capturing these awards. Next slide, please. I also want to highlight our disaster research response program, which received $325,000 for COVID-19 uh, COVID related activities. So the DR2, uh, DR2 program is led by Aubrey Miller and his colleagues in the office of the director in Bethesda. And this is being done in collaboration with the National Library of Medicine. So DR2 has been cultivating a new collection of resources and tools for epidemiologists clinicians and other scientists studying COVID-19. So the new publicly available DR2 COVID-19 data collection tool and, and protocol repository, which by the way, we transferred now to the servers here at NIHS was initiated in April and now includes over 90 data collection tools and instruments. DR2 has been continuously working to improve the catchment of new surveys and protocols through an online intake form and, uh, and works to improve end user experience to access and compare surveys by topic areas of interest. You know, NIH uh, uh, NOCES um, encourage scientists to select COVID-19 survey tools and protocols from the DR2 repository. And this we hope will minimize the proliferation of those one-off survey tools. And in the end, we hope that this DR2 resource will, will play a very important role in enhancing the standardization of data collection and will enhance comparisons of, uh, of samples across uh, different research groups and will facilitate data integration and collaboration. So next slide, please. So I also wanna highlight the work of Doug Bell and Ozzy Lazoya who have uh, developed a, a new uh, technology or new way of, of testing for COVID-19 through a hyperplexed sample barcoded screening tool uh, using next generation sequencing. 
So it's remarkable that of the $1.5 billion provided by Congress for developing enhanced testing capabilities, this is the only program, intramural program, that was funded. The rest of the money went to the extramural community. The technology involves barcoding individual RT-PCR samples, massively pooling them together, and then conducting a high throughput next gen sequencing run to decode the results. This, re this represents a transformative approach for conducting high throughput uh, and inexpensive testing for COVID-19. They have added a nuance to their approach for testing, uh, unlike some of the other technologies that are commercially available and that were funded through the Radix Tech, um, in that they will include gene expression profiling of individual samples, um, especially those that are positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So, and they're doing this because it appears that uh, they have data to suggest that the SARS-CoV-2 infection changes the expression uh, profile of genes that are expressed within the peripheral blood lymphocytes that they're examining. So next slide, please. So before I end comments on uh, theme two, there's another noteworthy event that uh, happened um, yeah, since our last virtual meeting in June that I wanna highlight. And this was the fourth annual NIEHS Global Environmental Health Day 2020, which happened on Earth Day last July. Of course, we conducted this, uh, conducted this virtually, and I'm pleased to say that we attracted more than 550 registrants from 37 different countries. The event included July's NIEHS Global Environmental Health Program webinar on climate, environment, and health. Uh, Howard Frumkin, Professor Emeritus at the University of Washington, opened with his keynote talk about the twin crises in climate and public health. Uh, Christy Eby from the University of Washington gave the second keynote address and emphasized the importance of collaborating with health departments at local and national levels and um, for managing health risks of climate change. So several NIHS grant recipients spoke about connections between climate change and human health outcomes. And overall, I thought the event was extremely successful. So congratulations to John Balbus and uh, Trisha, uh, Trisha Castriano, uh, Castriano for a job very well done in organizing that. Next slide, please. So let me move now on to theme three of our, on our strategic planning involving enhancing environmental health through stewardship and support. So let's, let me go to the next slide. I just wanna move things along here a little bit. Um, I wanna start off by introducing you to one of our most recent tenure track recruits in DIR. Jason Watts, uh, MD-PhD, joined NIHS as an NIH STADMAN investigator in the Epigenetics and Stem Cell Biology Laboratory. He has been selected into the 2020 cohort of the NIH Distinguished Scholars Program. So we want to welcome to Jason. Next slide. I also want to recognize a number of awards from members of the environmental health sciences community. First, I am pleased to announce that our own Michael Fessler, um, in our uh, intramural research program here at NIHS, has been awarded a 2020 National Institutes of Health Director's Challenge Innovation Award. He received this award for his proposal to advance and standardize methods for metabolomics and lipidomics across the entire NIH intramural research program. Next slide. I also want to acknowledge um, the Environmental Health Factor Editor-in-Chief, Kelly Lennox, who was honored uh, with a 2020 Blue Pencil and Gold Screen Award from the National Association of Government Communicators, the NAGC. So Lennox won second place in the writer's uh, portfolio category for a series of newsletter articles that highlight environmental health. This NAGC award is the third in four years for the environmental factors. So fabulous work. Um, so next slide, please. I'm also pleased to announce that the Occupational Health and Safety section of the American Public Health Association selected Joseph Chip Hughes to receive the 2020 Alice Hamilton Award. Alice Hamilton is considered the founder of occupational health in the United States. She was a tireless activist and physician who dedicated her life to improving the health and safety of workers. She was committed to science, service, and compassion. This award recognizes the lifelong contributions of individuals who have distinguished themselves through a career of hard work and dedication to improve the lives of workers. And I can't imagine someone more deserving of this award than Chip. So again, congratulations, Chip. Next slide, please. 
I also want to acknowledge several members of the staff at NIHS who are recipients of the 2020 NIH Director's Award, which is the highest award given by the NIH, and it signifies demonstrated superior leadership and a significant contribution to an important project. So Catherine Katie Hamilton was uh, recognized for her exemplary initiative, creativity, leadership, and dedication in founding and developing the first post-baccalaureate program at NIEHS. Humphrey Yao was recognized for his exemplary scientific discovery and uh, many discoveries on studying mammalian reproductive biology and was also recognized for his dedication to mentoring NIEHS trainees. Also, the Breast Cancer and Environment Research Program, the BSERP team, was recognized for their excellence in the management of the trans NIH Collaborative Initiative on Breast Cancer and Environmental Factors. So the, member of the uh, members of the team include Janice Allen, Linda Bass, Brianne Benton, A.B. Boyles, Jennifer Collins, Gwen Coleman, Lisa Edwards, Barbara Gittleman, Alfonso Latoni, Elizabeth Mall, Kendra Morrison, Aaron Nicholas, Les Reinlib, Thad Shug, Claudia Thompson, James Williams, Tram Kim Lam, Gary Ellison, Armin Guzarian, Ron Johnson, Ilanetta, Naraja Suthamurthy, and Debbie Wen. So next slide, please. And we, we heard earlier today about the, the, river, or the river program, and I want to just take a couple of minutes to recognize some of the recent river awardees. So in the interest of time, I also want to apologize that I will not have time to announce the ones awardees. So the details are in the printed materials for today's meeting, and I encourage you to review the list of awardees, very well deserving of being acknowledged. You heard about the river program today, but to remind you, the river program is the centerpiece of our emerging effort to support people, not projects. We're doing this by providing support to investigators who have demonstrated a broad vision with the potential for continuing impactful research. So next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go back one slide. <laughs> okay, here we are. So the first person I want to acknowledge is Dana Dolanoy from the University of Michigan, who will use, as you heard earlier, will use her River Award to identify changes in DNA, non-coding RNA, and gene expression after exposure to metals and plasticizers. I also want to recognize, as you heard, Joan Sweezy from the University of Arizona, who will continue her research to study the connection between DNA repair and the development of lupus and autoimmune disease. And I also want to recognize a former intramural or an NIEHSer, uh, Ben Van Houten, who is currently at the University of Pittsburgh. He is using his River Award to develop groundbreaking technologies to understand how different forms of DNA damage can be detected and repaired in a living cell. Next slide, please. I also want to uh, recognize a couple of uh, other River Awardees, um, Yin Shen Wang from the University of California at Riverside who will be studying how alkylated DNA lesions affect DNA stability and how they can alter gene expression and ultimately lead to disease. And finally, uh, again, we heard this morning about Donna Zhang from the University of Arizona. Uh, she received a River Award to study the development of arsenic-related diseases such as lung cancer and type 2 diabetes. And she hopes to identify new pharmaceuticals to treat arsenic-related uh, health effects. So next slide, please. So finally, in the, the last part of my talk, I want to uh, you know, turn to the issues of racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So these are topics that we'll be focusing on for much of the rest of the council meeting. And as you know, these issues have been in the spotlight since the killing of George Floyd, and Dr. Collins expressed his heartbreak and devastation in a remarkable all hands uh, message. Um, and he sent this out immediately after the event. I followed with a message, um, an all hands email to NIHS staff to express my personal commitment that we will implement the necessary changes in order to address the issues of racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion at NIHS. Next slide, please. So my commitment is to facilitate lasting change in the culture of the, at the Institute. I'm not interested in doing something quickly just for the sake of making us all temporarily feel better. 
And these knee-jerk responses really don't lead to lasting improvement. So to implement meaningful change, I, I believe that we first need to better understand what it is we need to do to change. So therefore, we have started a, a rigorous process for the entire leadership team across the Institute to get out in front of our staff and to listen to their input. We started with an all hands listening session. Um, and then I encouraged each division director to have listening sessions within their divisions. So we learned a lot from these meetings. And I have to say that I personally found much of the heartfelt input from the staff to be sobering, disturbing, uh, yet insightful and uh, in helping us develop plans. Next slide. So at the same time that we're listening and developing plans for changing the culture at NIEHS, Dr. Collins and Tabak have been working with the IC directors to study the problems associated with racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion across the NIH. The IC directors have been meeting uh, almost on a weekly basis on, to discuss this topic since the middle of June. So uh, Dr. Tabak solicited input from all ICs, and they also received input from a number of other sources, including a group called Eight Changes for Racial Equity. It's abbreviated uh, number eight, C-R-E, and it's pronounced ACRE. And the URL for that is shown on the slide. Uh, it says supportacre.com. So I encourage you to take a look, uh, call up the URL, take a look, and you can examine those eight different changes that they're suggesting uh, for change. So in the discussion with the IC directors, we spent a lot of time exploring and discussing the structural racism that exists at the NIH and at NIH funded organizations. We all agreed that solving the problems cannot be just about increasing diversity in our hiring practices. We have to address the structural racism that exists at the NIH because those diverse recruits will not thrive in an environment with structural racism. There is clearly a lot of work to be done at the level of the NIH and I know that Drs. Collins and Tabeck are up to the task and we'll be working with IC directors to implement a framework to address structural racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. In fact, we have another IC directors meeting this coming Thursday, and we'll be taking it to the next level, talking about how we can be putting together various committees to develop implementation plans. Next slide, please. But NIEHS leadership has not been waiting for directors from Bethesda on these issues. We want to coordinate what we're doing ultimately with what's happening in Bethesda, uh, but we've had monthly meetings since the beginning of June. We've identified four different strategic areas to focus on to implement change. Training and education, science of racism and environmental health disparities, workplace diversity, and culture and inclusion. Uh, together, we decided that it's best to bring in a professional firm that to help us devise implementation plans. Bring in, you know, as far as I'm concerned, bring in the professionals, people who really know how to guide us. And then, uh, help us develop the tools to listen and then develop plans where we can actually do things very specifically to implement change. So our acting deputy director, Gwen Coleman, will be working with all members of the leadership team and staff across the Institute uh, to coordinate efforts to identify a firm that will be best suited for our needs. We hope to use the same open space format that we used for our original strategic plan back in uh, 2011. And we hope that this will be a mechanism to, that will help us to ensure that we get comprehensive input and feedback from all staff across the NIEHS and any plans that come together for addressing racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I should add that these planning efforts are currently on hold, unfortunately, while we resolve the executive order that came out last week from the White House that prohibits the use of taxpayer funds to support training on these topics. So, Stay tuned, we have a, an opinion going into the Office of General Counsel to evaluate what it is that we can be doing on this front. Next slide, please. But we're not waiting for a consultant to come in to help us make decisions. A couple of weeks ago, the leadership team made the decision to form a fifth cross-divisional group charged with thinking about environmental racism, uh, environmental justice, environmental health disparities research, and how the Institute can move forward in these areas. Leadership is encouraging staff across all five divisions to come up with new directions and to generate ideas that could be brought back to leadership for their approval. The group will be asked to consider new and innovative approaches for studying the impact of racism on environmental health. They will also be asked uh, to explore interactions and share, uh, asked to ex explore interactions and sharing of their ideas across the divisions at NIEHS. So it's not just about one division, we wanna go across the entire institute. 
So in the end, leadership hopes that the, the group can help with suggestions to elevate environmental health disparities research in a way that will lead to new policies for change. The new cross-divisional group will complement the four existing groups on neurosciences, metabolomics, microbiome, and combined exposures and mixtures, and will be eligible to apply for funds to support these efforts. Next slide, please. So in response to a, whoops, let me, um, sorry, go back one slide. I'm sorry, go forward one slide. We changed slides. Okay, go, go forward one slide. Okay, so in response to a recommendation from an all hands meeting, in fact, our first all hands meeting, I think it came from Trevor Archer, NIHS is launching a new lecture series uh, to honor former NIHS director Ken Olden. The Ken J. Olden Distinguished Lecture Series will be a new annual event that will recognize and celebrate outstanding scientists from underrepresented groups who work in environmental health sciences and environmental justice. Dr. Olden served as the third director of NIHS and the second director of the NTP from 1991 to 2005. The lecture series will serve as a tribute to his life and his career. Dr. Trevor Archer, head of the NIEHS Epigenetics and Stem Cell Biology Laboratory, is chairing the speaker selection committee for the annual lecture series. So I'm pleased to say that Dr. Olden himself will provide the inaugural lecture next week on September 21st. So the lecture will be avail available to watch via live webcast. If you don't know how to get access to this, let us know and we'll get you the URL. Next slide, please. So next slide, I somehow I've missed the slide. So next slide, let me see if I can go back to this. Nope, go back. Okay, so I tell you what, I've, I missed the last slide, but I just want to also comment that, uh, let's see here. So, so in addition to the Olden Lecture Series, NIHS we has the Office of Science, Education, and Diversity, OSED. And this coordinates the NIHS diversity speaker. There it is. How did I miss that? Okay. <laughs> so it's the old, okay, so NIHS, it's the Office of Science, Education, and Diversity. And uh, this co uh, coordinates the NIHS Diversity Speaker Series, which is uh, designed to highlight the NIH equity, diversity, and inclusion special emphasis portfolios. And this would happen during the traditional months of heritage. So actually, this is the, uh, the Latino uh, Heritage Month, uh, September. So local speakers are invited from neighboring colleges and universities, and uh, they share their stories, research, and their experiences. But I also want to emphasize that OSED is much more than just the diversity speaker series. Uh, probably most important, uh, under Dr. Birnbaum's leadership, uh, she re helped to recruit uh, Dr. Erica Reed, uh, who started a new program called the NIEHS Scholars Connect program. So this program provides a unique opportunity for local undergraduate students in STEM fields, particularly those from underrepresented minority groups, to receive hands-on training in biomedical research along with professional and personal development. So as OSET also coordinates our active participation in the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Hispanics and Native Americans in Science, it's called SACNIS. And it coordinates the annual biomedical research conference for minority students called Abercroms. So OSET also coordinates the North Carolina Women of Color Research Network, which is a product of the NIH Working Group on Women in Biomedical Careers. The organization works to promote career advancement by broadening participation of women researchers and scientists of color uh, and in establishing collaborations, partnerships, multi-level mentoring, outreach, and professional networking. So next slide, please. There we are. So OSED is also coordinating the development and the management of the diversity, equity, and inclusion website for NIEHS. So the website will be the central repository for all issues relating to diversity equity and inclusion. So let me go to my final slide. Next slide. So there is a lot of work that still needs to be done. And these are just a few bullet points here to kind of summarize some of the challenges that we face. We have to make sure that everything we're doing at NIEHS is ultimately in alignment with the plans that are emerging from Bethesda. 
would be a disaster for us to be working independently and in parallel with things that are happening in other ICs. And I'm confident that Dr. Tabak and Collins are going to work with us to, to integrate our efforts. I mean, we need to address why African-American and black scientists and other underrepresented minorities are not getting their grants funded. So you'll be hearing a lot more of that in Pat Mastin's talk. I suspect that Hannah Ballantyne will be talking about this as well. And um, you know, this is a tough problem. We've got to figure this out. We have to work, uh, we, have, we have much more work to do to enhance mentoring opportunities for underrepresented minority scientists. We've got to get programs out there so that um, you know, once minority scientists are hired, that they have rich opportunities to be mentored and to succeed and, and, um, and to get their grants funded and to, to become senior scientists. We need to be more creative in hiring in our hiring strategies to bring in a broader base of racially diverse staff uh, in the Institute across all different levels of hiring. And most importantly, we need to better understand and to take corrective actions to eliminate the structural racism that exists within NIEHS. So I'm hoping that we can engage members of council um, in these discussions to bring your wisdom and your experiences at your organizations to bear on our institute's desire to move forward on racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So let me stop at this point and uh, we can turn off the slides and let's open the Hollywood squares. And I'm happy to take any and all questions. And I'm not seeing any questions in the chat room. I raised my hand. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Jose. Um, Rick, um, thank you so much uh, for your presentations. And, and uh, I, I'd love to talk about the wonderful work that's been doing research, and it's just amazing. But just wanted to, to briefly go on the um, institutional racism. And I think that the work's been done all over NIH is uh, highly commendable. Um, it, the, the question I have is, um, recognize that they, uh, that they're recognizing that there is structural racism. It's very, very important and the big first step. Uh, the question is, uh, can you talk a little bit about the process of identifying where this uh, uh, institutional racism occurs and and uh, especially how do, that may be impacting uh, the funding and I would say the professional development of investigators that are come from minority groups. Well Jose th those are great questions and, and I wish that that we at NIHS and the IC directors and, and Drs. Collins and Tabak have, have researched and and explored this, this, this whole issue in such depth that I can give you a precise answer. The, we're at a point though where we just, you look at the data um, and you'll see some of this data in both Pat's presentation and Hannah Bellin's presentation. There's clearly um, a bias, conscious and unconscious bias in, um, in funding of uh, African-American, black and other underrepresented minority grants. And, and as part of the listening sessions, we've gotten an earful, I mean, across the NIH of the things that are contributing to clearly what is structural racism. We, we don't know yet though, specifically what, what we can do, you know, what exactly needs to happen uh, so that we can fix this problem. I think what the IC directors have recognized is that it's, it's fundamentally about changing the culture at the NIH and changing the culture within the biomedical research enterprise. I mean, there are so many things right now that are just inconsistent with the way that we treat each other. And we've got to do something about that. And um, so they, they, the IC, it's very interesting. The IC directors came up with, in their thorough analysis, came up with the seed in the soil example. And that's where we decided that it can't be just about increasing more diversity in the people that recruit. So you want to sow you know, the, a more diverse set of seeds. Uh, so that would be one way of increasing diversity within the organization. But if the soil 
is not compatible with allowing those seeds to develop and to, and to grow, you got a problem. And so that's where you know, we're, we're just struggling to figure out, we know that there's a problem and we've got to figure out you know, what specifically can we do to address the issues of structural racism. You know, I encourage you to take a look at the, uh, the ACRE website and there are th eight specific recommendations. And it's remarkable that all of the input coming in from the 27 institutes or centers that we provided to Dr. Payback, a lot of the input is aligning with those eight principles from the ACRE group. So if you wanna know um, where some of our efforts are gonna be coalescing around, you know, I strongly suggest take a look at those eight different, or you and others on, on the council and, and at the Institute, take a look at those eight recommendations. And I, I'm gonna be happy to report back to you next February when we meet again. And I'm hoping that I'll have uh, more specific uh, suggestions on exactly what it is we're doing to address the problem. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah, thank you. That's very, very helpful. I'll just uh, bring one low hanging fruit from the discussions today. And it's that, that I think the, the fact that uh, race and ethnicity has been stripped from uh, the applications, uh, although I think it has a very good intention, it really probably has had some unintended consequences like now not having data on who applies and who doesn't apply, and then uh, a, what, what actually is the success rate uh, in different minorities. And from that, beginning to look at what are the barriers or perhaps what are the enhancers for actually getting funded? And is it a, something at the individual level or is just the institution where they come from, et cetera? But that may be one place uh, to think about. Well, Jose, you're going to hear more of the, the data that we've collected as part of the, I think Pat's going to be covering that. And mm -hmm. Hannah Valentine, who is um, actually unfortunately is leaving the NIH, but she is, she's really in the, in her job is really to promote a diversified scientific workforce. Uh, but she will have some very compelling data slides. Great. And, um, and she's recommending some very specific things that IC directors and others in the broader biomedical research community can be doing to actually address some of these issues of structural racism. So stay tuned, a lot of work to, to be done. I, I just wish this were a simple problem, uh, but it's not, it's a multifaceted problem. And if we wanna make progress, I think instead of, as I mentioned, instead of just jumping out and doing something quickly, you know, requiring everyone do unbiased um, you know, consciousness training, and then we're done with it, uh, I'm committed to making sure that we implement lasting changes. And I think it's, it's really fundamentally about changing the culture of the organization. That's going to be more difficult, but uh, we've got a lot of really good momentum. A lot of people are behind this. I know the entire leadership team at NIEHS here is behind me and, and we're working together to make things happen. So stay tuned. And any recommendations you have after today's, um, uh, today and tomorrow's council meeting, you know, please, please, uh, you and other members of council, please provide us with these suggestions. Other comments? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Rick. I just wanted to, to reinforce what you said. This has been a dis topic of discussion in the uh, Office of Extramural Research and, and um, at NIHS, along with the, uh, the uh, directors of the uh, external divisions like myself. Um, it's been a uh, hot topic and it's very controversial. And, and we're being told right now that it's, um, this is not something we can use to, uh, to make funding decisions or whatever. But, so hopefully tomorrow we can address this more further. Uh, further, I'm sorry. Um, uh, let's turn to Dr. White Newsom, you had a question? Yes, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Awesome. Um, so first of all, thanks so much for the, the, the update and, and kind of the process that you're undergoing in terms of looking at diversity, equity, inclusion. And, and I guess, you know, just wondering, just a, a couple of questions. One, um, again, being new, how do you foresee the council, uh, us kind of being integrated into the activities of the institution and maybe one or two specific examples would be super helpful for me. And then I guess the second piece, maybe uh, bridging off of, of Jose's, you know, just thinking about are there any things in addition to kind of the 
education and I think the, the process that you're taking, which is really important, um, are there any kind of immediate things that can be done in terms of COVID response and the climate-related crises that are going on that you could do now to, to better address, again, some of the, the results of structural racism, uh, you know, that, that could be that could be useful at this time. So I, I'm just wondering, so, so it's kind of those two questions. Sure. Well, let me address the first question, uh, which is how, how can we get counsel? Really um, tapping your wisdom, your experiences, and, and helping to make things happen. Is that, was that the nature of your question? Yeah, it was, it was more so like, uh, it, you know, what are some examples of how you've used counsel in the past, particularly for issues that it have, you know, maybe raised up like this? So where, whether it's identifying a consultant or coming in to provide guidance for a particular, you know, entity, it, you know, so yeah, more so, more specific. I mean, definitely, yeah, if possible. We have, we have some very specific requests. Uh, that are coming out. I, I didn't have time to cover these in my overview presentation, but you'll be hearing more about this. And as we get through our council meeting, uh, but suffice it to say that we, we view council as a, you know, a critically important advisory group. And so we, when we choose all of you to be on council because of your, your, your wisdom, your experience, um, and your thoughtfulness, and we want to be able to tap into that. So we have some very specific ideas. And instead of in the interest of time now, uh, let me just postpone answering your question. And then if, and if, and if I don't answer that, that question by the end of council, feel free at the, at the end to readdress that to me, because hopefully it should become a little bit clearer how we're thinking of integrating uh, you and other members of council into our whole COVID, uh, into our, um, our racism, diversity, equity, inclusion planning. So I'm sorry, what was the second question again, quickly, just to trigger my memory? Uh, any low hanging fruit, any things that can be done now in terms of the institution as it relates to the COVID crisis, the racial crisis, the climate crisis, all these things that impact environmental health and environmental injustice. Uh, so just wondering if that has been a part of the discussions as well. We, we've been, I mean, we're not waiting for the consultant to come in. There have been a number of things. And in fact, um, one of the, this, 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 this cross-divisional planning group that I alluded to very briefly in my, my overview, we think that'll be very important. So it's, it's a group that is being charged with coming up with specific recommendations on research area in environmental justice. Um, and in, in racism and, and other sorts of issues as it relates to uh, environmental health sciences. So we have that. Uh, we have, um, we also think, um, for example, the, the Ken Olden lecture, which is long overdue, just based on his, his recognition uh, as an outstanding environmental health scientist, but just bringing more awareness to the underserved minority uh, environmental health scientists and bringing them in as distinguished lecturers on an annual basis. So we're trying to chip away and to do things that just make a lot of sense and that we think, you know, can help to create a culture of inclusiveness and, and awareness of the, the value of diversity in the scientific enterprise. Let me uh, just uh, well, ask my colleagues, um, is, um, uh, any of my colleagues on senior management, anyone else want to chime in? This is a very important question that we're being asked. Um, anyone else want to chime in? Gwen, do you want to comment on, I know that you've been- I'd, I'd be happy to, but I, I might give uh, Delone an example or two from past, how council has participated in a number of our activities. So one of our um, programs that we're most proud of is called the Partnerships for Environmental Public Health. And this is a program that really focuses on environmental justice and, and bringing uh, academic researchers and communities together to address uh, issues related to the disproportionate burden of environmental exposures and their health risks. And that program was uh, developed 10 years ago um, with very um, active involvement of council. 
we created a uh, program development group and we had council representatives on that and we um you know we we talked about the needs and um the strategies we looked at the history of what the institute had done and we started to chart a course going forward we also then had a workshop on that topic and we brought council members in that and mixing with members of the um, research community including uh, the health disparities um, investigators who were focusing on social determinants of health and we created a strategy going forward to look at both social determinants of health and environmental exposures in the broader consideration of health disparities um, another very quick thing is is that when rick came to the institute and we had our strategic planning process uh, using this concept called open space technology, all of the council members were involved in participating in those strategic planning activities. And so, you know, in the broad sense, we want to listen to tomorrow's conversation and discussion and think about steps moving forward. And that's our, it's our intention in involving council in as many ways as possible to tap into the resources and knowledge base that you all have. Hope that was helpful. Um, we have one question, uh, more question from uh, Katrina, you want to sure. ask so, a question? Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation and I was uh, impressed by the range of training at, uh, you have planned. Um, my question is, I've spoken with friends in other federal agencies in the last couple of weeks who are really distressed about having to cancel trainings in wake of the White House's memo saying that federal agencies are not allowed to do such training. So my question is first, how's that affecting you in these efforts? And the second one sort of related to Delone's question is, how could we help? Because um, unless those extend to grantees and some of us probably have some resources that are not from NIH, there, perhaps there would be a way that we would be able to assist in that pending vacuum. Uh, Katrina, that's a great question. And I wish I had a very specific answer for you. Uh, when the, um, the executive order came out, uh, many of us contacted Dr. Collins and Dr. Tabak for their advice. And the, re the only response they can provide at this point is that it's in the Office of General Counsel trying to evaluate this. Uh, so we are part of the executive branch. Um, I mean, my boss ultimately is uh, the President of the United States. And so we have to you know, abide by you know, the orders that are coming in from the White House. So it gets, all I can say is let's, uh, let's hold on and let's wait until we get some legal advice to, to better understand exactly what does the executive order mean uh, for the way that we're you know, conducting our business. So I'm sorry, I can't, I can't be more specific with you. Just a quick follow-up since some people are giving me confused look. Is it all right with you if I plunk the um, PDF link for that into the group chat so everyone knows what I'm talking about? I think that would be okay. In the public domain, absolutely. Right. Right. Yep. Thank you. Are there any further questions? I will point, um, there's a nice chat going on in the chat room. Um, if you all have time to follow that, I would recommend it. Um, if there are no further questions for Rick, um, we're running a little bit behind and I think we should probably move on if that's all right, Rick. That's fine with me. And if there are other questions, just feel free to send me an email. Great. And I want to, our uh, next speaker will be Dr. Chandra Jackson. I want to thank her for her patience as we're running a little bit behind. But I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Daryl Zeldin, who will provide us an introduction. So thank you, uh, Pat. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Chandra Jackson, who is an Earl Stadman uh, tenure track investigator in our epidemiology branch in the intramural program at NIEHS. Uh, she also has a joint appointment at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, or NIMHD. So Chandra received her uh, master's degree in epidemiology from the Harvard uh, T.H. Chan School of Public Health in 2007, and her PhD degree in epidemiology from Johns Hopkins University in 2012. Uh, she then became an Alonzo Smythe uh, Yerby postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard School of Public Health before becoming a research associate at the Harvard Catalyst Clinical and Translational Science Center. Uh, we recruited her to NIEHS as a tenure track investigator in 2017, and uh, she directs the Social and Environmental Determinants of Health Equity Group, uh, which investigates pathways uh, by which factors in the physical and social environments 
impact racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities in sleep health and subsequent risk of cardiometabolic dysfunction. Chandra has co-authored over 60 uh, peer-reviewed publications and her work has been cited over 3,400 times, which is quite impressive for somebody at her uh, stage of her career. Uh, of note, uh, she is the 2019 recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award uh, for Scientists and Engineers, and she was selected to participate in the National Academy of Medicine Emerging Leaders Forum. Uh, so today, Chandra's talk is titled Social and Environmental Determinants as well as Health Consequences of sleep disparities. And I'll turn it over to Chandra who will share her screen and her slides. Thank you, Chandra. Great, can you see my screen in presentation mode? Perfect. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Zeldin, and good afternoon, everyone. As a social epidemiologist interested in modifiable contextual factors that contribute to disparities uh, in health, I'm delighted to present an overview of some research and concepts relevant to social and environmental determinants as well as health consequences of sleep disparities. As background uh, information, sleep health is multidimensional. It appears to be a simple behavior, yet its underlying physiology is rather complex. Interestingly, sleep is only partially endogenous and can be affected either positively or negatively by exogenous or environmental factors, including, for instance, light, temperature and noise. Uh, to promote or maintain optimal physical and mental health, sleep would entail adequate duration, meaning at least seven hours of quality, quality uh, restorative, uninterrupted sleep within a 24-hour period, uh, high efficiency or spending at least 85% of one's time in bed actually sleeping when sleep is uh, the intention appropriate timing, essentially at night to avoid a circadian misalignment, sustained mental alertness during waking hours and not feeling excessively sleepy throughout the day, uh, as well as simply being satisfied with one's sleep. And all of this would need to occur consistently over time. And so an important point here is that even in the absence of an obvious sleep disorder, there's likely room for improvement among most individuals as well as populations, which may translate into more widespread tangible health benefits. And so this focus on sleep is of tremendous public health importance, although it's currently understudied and underappreciated by policymakers, researchers, and the lay community. And um, as an example, out of the approximately 324 million U.S. citizens, an estimated 50 to 70 million adults have sleep or wakefulness disorders, including uh, obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia. In fact, the then Institute of Medicine released a report in 2006 identifying sleep as an unmet public health need. And the Department of Health and Human Services also developed a Healthy People 2020 objective to increase the proportion of adults getting the recommended amount of sleep, which has been expanded upon for the new 2030 objectives. A sleep deprivation currently costs the U.S. approximately $63 billion in work-related loss in terms of productivity and healthcare costs per year. Around 60 million prescriptions for sleeping pills are written annually. There are over 30, 300,000 accidents each year attributed to insufficient sleep, and sleep disturbances have been associated with a wide range of health uh, conditions that are common and uh, unfavorable, including obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and premature mortality. And unfortunately, disparities exist in both sleep as well as these related health outcomes. 
And so before I summarize the current literature uh, regarding sleep disparities, I want to ensure that we're all on the same page. And so according to the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, where I have an affiliation, um, a disparity can be defined as a health difference that adversely affects defined disadvantaged populations based on one or more health outcomes. And these health outcomes are generally considered preventable and therefore environmental versus innate or genetic. Uh, the defined disadvantaged populations as designated by the National Institutes of Health based on exposure to social, underscore, social disadvantage include Blacks or African Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and other Pacific Islanders, socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, underserved rural populations, as well as sexual and gender minorities. And two examples of health outcomes identified in this definition include a population of interest having a higher incidence or a prevalence of disease, including earlier onset or more aggressive progression, and uh, as a second example, premature or excessive mortality from specific conditions. And so this definition represents an improvement because it helps researchers avoid conflating the determinants or causes of disparities with the consequences that are usually biological. It can also serve as a guideline for determining if a disparity exists for a particular outcome of interest. And so with that context, across various measures of sleep-wake function and socially constructed um, racial ethnic categories, you find that racial and ethnic minorities are less likely to get the recommended amount of sleep, with the exception of Latinos who were not born in the United States. There is evidence of lower sleep efficiency across racial ethnic minority groups in general, and where data exists, minorities spend less time in slow wave sleep, which we consider physiologically restorative in terms of, for instance, cellular, as well as tissue growth and repair. So you see rather consistently that there's greater variability in sleep timing, um, could lead to circadian misalignment and more daytime sleepiness, uh, which could be influenced by social structures related to, for instance, occupational factors. Uh, despite poor sleep characteristics, with the exception of multiracial females, racial ethnic minorities are less likely to complain about their sleep, which has important implications for the use of self-reported data. African Americans and Asians are more likely to consider themselves of a morningness chronotype, which can also be influenced by exogenous or environmental factors uh, related to, for instance, societal demands like occupation. For uh, obstructive sleep apnea, one of the most common sleep disorders, uh, despite an issue with underdiagnosis, Blacks or African Americans, Latinos, and Asians are more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea. And the data for insomnia are rather mixed, but the weight of the evidence suggests, despite methodological and sampling concerns, that whites are more likely uh, to be diagnosed with insomnia. Uh, alarmingly, uh, these disparities in sleep health and sleep disorders start early in life. And this slide shows one example where Black compared to white infants uh, had an over threefold higher odds of not getting the recommended amount of at least 12 hours of sleep. And Hispanic or uh, Latino infants had a 2.5 fold higher odds. Um, a review also concluded that Black children and those living in low socioeconomic status households had a higher risk or prevalence of sleep disordered breathing. And this is not at all believed to be due to genetic differences, but differences in uh, physical environments. And an example would be living in um, in a physical environment with allergens could exacerbate um, issues with tonsils leading to um, respiration concerns, therefore sleep disordered breathing when the muscles um, relax uh, during sleep. And so my group uh, recently published in the Journal of Sleep Research 
a nationally representative study finding that pregnant versus non-pregnant women, uh, for instance, were uh, more likely to report trouble staying <coughs> And compared to pregnant white women, pregnant black women had a higher prevalence of short sleep, while pregnant Hispanic and Latina women were less likely to have trouble staying asleep. There's also a fair amount of data um, that's not coming from my group uh, demonstrating that um, pregnant women, and especially those in marginalized groups, are more likely to experience um, hypoxemia or sleep disorder breathing, which could have implications for both maternal and fetal health, and that is currently under study. And the environment could be a contributor. And so in this slide, I warn you, it will be rather busy, but comprehensive. I am adapting the well-known social ecological framework to sleep and circadian rhythms because this particular framework is useful for conceptualizing the various determinants as well as health consequences of sleep health in the population overall, but also in terms of health disparities. And so in the figure, I've highlighted sleep as an individual level downstream determinant of health. And historically, we've been conducting research almost exclusively within this necessary but limited frame by investigating, for instance, the health effects of sleep physiology on, for example, something I'm interested in, type 2 diabetes. And researchers have uh, relatively recently started investigating disparities in sleep and its health consequences across a variety of demographic characteristics, including race and ethnicity, and have often predominantly concluded with a narrative that observed differences may be attributed to genetics or ancestral background. However, humans are social beings, and these individual level characteristics, including sleep, are shaped or influenced clearly by social and environmental determinants of health, like where an individual lives, works, or engages in recreational activities, a concept touted by the Centers for Disease Control. Um, and we know that where an individual lives, works, and engages in recreational activities can differ and fairly dramatically across social identity groups like race and ethnicity. And so these um, social and environmental factors can clearly have downstream consequences on biology, including circadian rhythms, with, for example, structural factors like occupational demands leading to shift work and therefore circadian misalignment, which could um, cause hormonal disruptions, for instance. Uh, and we know that occupational demands differ by identity like race. There's also clear evidence that environmental factors such as inopportune exposure to light, noise, and air pollution are associated with sleep disruption and sleep disorders. Again, you can think of obstructive sleep apnea. Therefore, uh, interventions focused on optimizing the intermediate um, or the immediate and broader environment uh, may help not only promote healthy sleep, but also prevent poor sleep health. Um, but we need more research to characterize the exposure response pathways in both the overall population and in terms of the contribution of environmental factors to disparities in sleep health, for example. And I actually think the exposome, which is part of the strategic plan at NIEHS, theme one, that it um, presents an unprecedented opportunity to incorporate the broader um, environment into even um, mechanistic research. Um, it's important to acknowledge that the intermediate determinants mentioned, such as air, light, and noise pollution, as well as psychosocial stress, which overburden marginalized groups, are also influenced by even more upstream determinants that are considered the fundamental causes of disparities. Uh, for instance, social conditions and institutions with policies and practices can become embodied in a person's biology by heavily influencing, for instance, where and how a person of a particular social identity is able to live in terms of residential neighborhoods and access to quality housing. Um, also where and how the individual works, 
um, accesses quality education and engages in recreational activities, thereby influencing direct exposures through either geographical spaces or social circumstances. So you can think of concentrated poverty or wealth and um, how they might impact sleep health. And historical concrete examples would include not only labor market segregation, but also racial residential segregation that still exists, resulting from policies known as redlining. Um, so for these reasons, institutional racism, which we've been discussing, is considered the main driver of health disparities resulting in minoritized groups having differential access to health promoting resources and greater exposure to health damaging environments. And this has uh, implications for my research area, sleep health disparities. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that a person's biology constantly interacts with both their physical and social environments across their lifespan from conception to death and differential exposure to these more adverse physical and social environments can affect sleep and may contribute to, for instance, differential ability to maintain biological homeostasis, leading to disproportionate burden of poor health outcomes among more under-resourced populations. And sleep may actually be an important but understudied component along the exposure disease pathway. Um, and so, in order to address the fundamental causes of health disparities, we need to incorporate more of the social and environmental determinants of health into our narratives, which will then inform and help to more comprehensively frame our research questions data collection, analyses, and interpretation uh, of the data. And so understanding the importance of research effort coordination um, and the need for innovation, a workshop was convened in 2018 by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, as well as the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. And so experts in sleep, circadian rhythms, and health disparities were called to identify research gaps, challenges, and opportunities to better understand and advance research to address sleep health disparities. And I was fortunate to be a co-chair for the workshop and to lead the uh, author um, lead the authorship list um, for the report published in um, one of the best journals in, in the field of sleep. And so major strategies emerging from the workshop included the need for researchers to develop and promote integrative research on sleep health disparities by first developing an agreed upon all encompassing uh, conceptual framework for the research area. Um, another, and the framework I just showed you um, was um, uh, one of their proposed frameworks. Another uh, strategy involved investigating the determinants or causes in combination with the consequences of sleep health disparities by better incorporating a uh, physical or built environmental as well as sociocultural factors into research related to biological mechanisms. And so the report also explicitly mentioned uh, the importance of investigating the three levels of racism and other forms of discrimination as major contributors to uh, hindered opportunity and cumulative chronic stress as drivers of disparities in sleep health. And so the group of experts also discussed developing effective interventions to promote sleep health through multi-level culturally tailored interventions, along with building research infrastructure and training opportunities, uh, which included the necessity to diversify the workforce. And so regarding intermediate determinants of where a person lives, works, and plays, uh, my theory for how suboptimal sleep contributes to disparities across a wide variety of outcomes is that healthy sleep, as depicted by this hypnogram across nine hours at the top, and at the bottom is a figure of circadian alignment. And so it could be um, that sleep is negatively affected by inopportune exposure to environmental light, temperature, noise, poor air quality, the timing and quality of uh, diet and 
physical activity, medication use, psychological stress, um, which can affect sleep duration, quality, and timing, leading to uh, disturbed sleep and circadian misalignment, which may contribute to a greater risk for, um, for example, depression, because we know that REM or rapid eye movement sleep is important for cognition and mood regulation. But if that stage of sleep is disrupted, there may be an increased risk for uh, mental, mental health conditions like uh, depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders. But also hypertension, because um, I mentioned the physiology of sleep. Well, at a certain period, blood pressure should drop at around 10%. But if your sleep is disrupted, you're not getting the dipping of blood pressure that could help um, with uh, blood pressure regulation. And so that might increase your risk of hypertension. But also diabetes, because sleep can rather acutely affect insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance. And um, poor sleep can compromise your immune system because there's less protective cytokines circulating um, when you're <coughs> disturbed. And this clearly could have implications for not only the common cold, but perhaps coronavirus. Um, but also cardiovascular disease because of inflammation and oxidative stress that is upregulated in the face of disturbed sleep. And even certain cancers um, could be affected because as an example, melatonin helps you fall asleep at night, but it's also an antioxidant, which, um, could help uh, prevent certain cancers. Um, and so we discussed where a person lives can influence their sleep health. And um, a relatively recent review of the epidemiological literature regarding associations between physical and social neighborhood characteristics and various sleep dimensions among adults concluded that adverse neighborhood and household level factors are associated with unfavorable sleep. For instance, living in adverse neighborhoods was associated with approximately seven to 11 minutes of less sleep on average in terms of duration, access to natural amenities, attenuated odds of insufficient sleep. So that could be um, a nice environmental intervention. And um, the relationship between the built environment is, and sleep is actually rather complex. So for example, more destinations and higher density may promote walking, which is beneficial for health and even sleep. But these same features can also promote noise, traffic, air pollution, and inopportune light exposure which can reduce sleep opportunity and quality. And so in terms of limitations of the literature, most of the studies were interestingly conducted mainly among non-Hispanic whites, despite racial ethnic minorities being much more likely to live in adverse uh, conditions and in concentrated poverty where the conditions would be um, worse than what you would capture um, with these um, sort of studies in this population. And so most, most studies also investigated mainly cross-sectional associations, measured only one aspect of the environment at a time, um, but there could be a synergistic effect, of course. Um, used mainly self-reported measures of sleep, and sleep duration was the most commonly studied dimension, although as I mentioned um, during the introduction, we know that there are many dimensions considered independently um, important for health. And so that was the neighborhood environment, but housing um, can uh, be an important independent contributor to sleep health and disparities as marginalized groups are more likely to reside in not only disordered neighborhoods, but in substandard housing conditions. And so we know that housing is designed to provide shelter or comfort from the physical elements like rain and extreme outdoor temperatures. Housing also provides ontological security or protection from social surveillance or judgment from the outside world, uh, which may be particularly important for marginalized groups who are already over surveilled. Um, the average American spends at least 80% of their time indoors 
And if getting the recommended amount of sleep, seven to nine hours of that time is spent in the bedroom in a micro sleep environment or the space between the mattress and the person's breathing zone. And um, so also with concentrated and prolonged exposure to both natural and anthropogenic environmental factors infiltrating the, the sleep environment or breathing zone. And so this is a potential reservoir for indoor pollutants like noise and plumes of poor air quality, um, as well as complex mixtures of chemical and non-chemical laden dust that can um, even be absorbed through the skin. And so this has implications for health uh, in general is not often considered, but also clearly for disparities because of the substandard um, conditions. Also relevant to sleep disparities and corroborating this notion that race should be considered a proxy for relative advantage or disadvantage instead of some biological construct. Uh, the figure to the right shows uh, prevalence ratios for short and very short sleep among Black compared to white men on the left and Black compared to white women on the right. Prevalence ratios for government-assisted housing, a marker of poverty, are, similar, um, are shown in blue, and prevalence ratios for unassisted rental housing are shown in red. And so essentially, there are no disparities in short and very short sleep between Black and white um, adult men and women, and poor uh, cardiometabolic health outcomes not shown here were attenuated when both groups resided in government assisted housing. So we're certainly not advocating for, for this, but it does demonstrate that when groups live in similar conditions, um, the disparities are non-existent or attenuated. And so it sort of underscores the importance of conducting, of race being a marker of disadvantage or advantage, and that we should conduct more a place-based research. And so in terms of work uh, environments and how it can impact sleep health, uh, short sleep has been shown to vary by industry of employment among U.S. workers, and work is believed to be connected to short sleep through, for instance, extended work hours, rotating or night shift work, impaired work-life integration, and job-related emotional as well as physical stress. Um, but very few studies have investigated disparities in the work-sleep relationship, but I knew um, there were several reasons to believe uh, that important differences exist. And I just want to take this opportunity to say that I've had many, many experiences um, where my lived experience or insight um, led to interesting and important research questions that uh, contributed to the literature in novel ways. And I think that's because there's a diversity of experiences um, around the table when uh, traditionally marginalized groups are included. And so um, we know, for instance, that African Americans are more likely to work non-traditional shifts with non-standard work schedules, especially night shifts, um, more likely to report long working hours, general job stress, experience, objective and perceived discrimination, work in low control, high demand positions with low decision making power, which is an established risk factor for heart disease, established by a um, social epidemiologist um, conducting research among British civil servants. And so um, we know that African Americans are more likely to work multiple low wage jobs and to live in poverty despite being employed and to live in disadvantaged under resource residential environments and to have less well connected professional networks to provide financial, emotional and informational support. And so with this understanding, we published a nationally representative study investigating black white disparities in age adjusted short sleep prevalence by industry of employment. In short, disparities were wide in some industries. For instance, the largest disparity was observed among participants employed in education, with whites having a short sleep prevalence of approximately 23% compared to uh, approximately 37% among Black adults, which translates into a large number of individuals that, for which this wouldn't be the case if disparities did not exist. Disparities were also large in other employment industries, such as finance and ironically in healthcare, and there were no significant uh, disparities in retail and food uh, and accommodation services. 
also demonstrating um, that um, the disparities are not inevitable. Um, and so we went a step further to investigate the prevalence of short sleep duration by occupational class within various employment industries. And uh, this is data from healthcare. And you see the novel finding that for each occupational class, either professional support services or laborers, the prevalence is highest among black uh, participants. You also see that the prevalence increased with increasing professional responsibility among blacks. Uh, and the disparity was largest among black uh, compared to white professionals and not laborers. So it's a very novel finding that we have followed up on in a mixed methods approach um, for which the data has already been collected and we've started to present on. And so job discrimination on the basis of social identity, whether institutional or structural, personally mediated or internalized, appears to contribute to sleep health disparities. And we recently examined if race, uh, sex or gender, age, health conditions, and sexual orientation modify the relationship between perceived job discrimination and various dimensions of sleep health among just over 26,000 working women across the U.S. And we found regarding race that uh, job discrimination on the basis of race was associated with a 37% increased odds of new onset insomnia symptoms. Um, there was also evidence of a compounding negative relationship with sleep health among participants who reported multiple forms of job discrimination. So think of an older Latina queer female employee as an example, with each of the four social categorizations possessing its own independent form of disadvantage due to societal marginalization. And so ultimately, these data raise concerns about sleep health disparities emanating from uh, discriminatory policies and practices in the workplace. And so I've provided uh, residential and work-related examples in terms of social, uh, but now in terms of social factors and sleep health, uh, this figure shows that compared to women without any traumatic childhood experiences, women who experienced any trauma, um, in childhood, whether a natural disaster, major accident, household dysfunction, sexual or physical abuse, or psychological or emotional trauma, were more likely to report short sleep, a long sleep latency, frequent awakenings, and excessive napping, all independently um, linked to uh, unfavorable health outcomes. And so in terms of disparities, this figure shows that compared to white women without any trauma um, in childhood, the prevalence of short sleep was over two times higher among black women with any traumatic childhood experience at the top of this figure, 50% uh, higher for Latina women and approximately 20% higher among white women with a traumatic childhood experience. And this is what we social epidemiologists refer to as social patterning, where um, estimates are um, in line with a level of social disadvantage in general. And so with regard to plausible pathways, because it may seem like an abstract relationship to some, Traumatic childhood experiences may uh, disrupt neural development, leading to psychiatric disorders that can contribute to um, sleep disorders in adulthood. It could also um, have been a proxy for household disruption that led to a failure to develop um, what we call uh, healthy sleep hygiene, which could lead to adult sleep disorders later in life if you don't learn um, the sort of recommended approach to a healthy sleep. And so moving from the intermediate to upstream determinants, again, considered the fundamental causes of health disparities, uh, discriminatory policies and practices influence health in myriad ways by, for example, determining where you can and can't live, as I've mentioned, uh, but also environmental exposures. You can think of which populations, like in Flint, Michigan, were disproportionately affected by unclean or unsafe drinking water. Um, who has access to economic opportunity, quality education, 
which is a social determinant of health because we know, for instance, schools are resourced based off of property taxes. And if a certain segment of the population hasn't had enough time to accrue wealth because of social circumstances, um, it's harder to access quality education. Um, but also who lives in food deserts or what we call now um, food apartheid. Um, but also exposed to other environmental uh, toxins and suboptimal housing conditions. And so as outlined by a recent report from the National Academies, research investigating potential racial differences or disparities needs to position its treatment of race within a social political framework. So historically, we researchers have treated race as a risk factor, but race should be considered again a proxy for relative disadvantage or advantage and um, a social as opposed to purely genetic or biological construct, which stems from a history of using race to justify subju subjugation. And so this is not saying that there aren't important um, features of um, a person's genome or a group's genome that influences health, but is it likely to, in terms of attributable risk, be more important than um, the social factors that are more readily modifiable. And so racism is the risk factor and its three forms are institutional or structural, like we've been discussing, personally mediated, and that's where most of the research has been conducted, but that is of limited but still important um, utility, uh, but also internalized uh, racism where you believe the negative stereotypes, for instance, um, uh, attributed to your social identity group. And so this is relevant for conceptualizing research questions, collecting and analyzing data, and interpreting the results of our studies, including those regarding um, sleep, my research area. And so this slide further underscores the importance of framing um, even sleep disparities research within a historical context, um, as it's likely that there are historical and contemporary reasons for the disparities in sleep we often observe between Blacks and whites, for example. And so his, an historian wrote a book in 2017, for which I was fortunate to write an invited review published in the journal Sleep Health, and the book postulates that social factors have always been and a substantial determinant of who gets the best sleep. So imagine sleep differences between the wealthy and the poor, and that the Black-white disparity in sleep likely has roots in historical events like unreconciled slavery. And so in this book, there are accounts of controlling the resting time of enslaved individuals as an efficient approach to strengthen the race-based slavery system by allowing just enough sleep for productivity, but not enough rest um, as to support a particular revolt. And so there's also a quote from Frederick Douglass uh, saying that more enslaved uh, people were whipped for oversleeping than for um, any other fault. And so much of the research to date um, has focused on interpersonal racism, as, as I've mentioned, and um, has been conceptualized as a social stressor that operates through diverse stress pathways, including physiology, psychological, and uh, behavioral mechanisms. Uh, but epidemiological studies have found that Blacks who reported greater levels of racism-related vigilance uh, or bracing themselves in anticipation of experiencing racism had higher levels of sleep difficulty, showing um, social patterning again in terms of level of uh, social disadvantage. Um, because Latinos also had a significant um, association with vigilance and, and poor sleep, um, but it wasn't as strong as Black participants, and there was no association um, among white participants. Um, there's also data suggesting that perceived day-to-day -day interpersonal racial discrimination like microaggressions um, is associated with greater sleep disturbances and daytime fatigue, as well as acquiring less deep sleep, again, considered physiologically restorative. And so potential biological mechanisms um, include um, interpersonal discrimination leading to stress that affects sleep, causes accelerated aging as measured by, for instance, allostatic load and shortened telomere length, or now these epigenetic aging clocks. 
So of note, in this example, there are social, behavioral, and biological pathways that link race to a health outcome. So imagine not incorporating the actually more modifiable upstream factors in order to prevent um, the exposure we are traditionally investigating that's considered unfavorable. Um, but it is important to note that to date, most of the research has been um, based on self-report, but there are um, concerns related to cognitive biases, including social desirability. And so self-reported data is actually even likely an underestimate of actual exposure, which can underestimate the magnitude of the association uh, between racial discrimination, for example, and adverse health outcomes. Um, and so I'm almost done, um, but it's important to know that there have already been generations of research simply documenting health disparities, uh, explaining uh, the main drivers, including some pathways, although not fully flushed out, uh, which is important to note does not actually preclude taking action. And, um, and investigators have also provided experts and evidence-based solutions. And so we're now um, in the intervention era. And so to the right of this slide, is a sample of recommended social determinants of health interventions to address the burden of structural racism, again considered a fundamental cause of preventable racial disparities in health, including sleep. Uh, and so the impact of these interventions on sleep could be evaluated as opposed to um, using this new area of sleep to observe all these racial differences in order to have enough evidence to conduct interventions. But now um, we have interventions idea to address the fundamental causes. And this is actually from the uh, former um, commissioner for the New York um, City Health Department. Uh, and so it's promising that we uh, focus on interventions as opposed to merely describing the disparities. And so ultimately, our goal is to achieve sleep health equity, uh, which can be defined as equitable opportunities that are given to each individual and or community based on their need, no matter their age, sex or gender, race, ethnicity, geographic location, and uh, socioeconomic status in order to obtain recommended, satisfactory, efficient sleep with appropriate timing that promotes physical and mental health as well as well-being. Uh, and so to conclude, Sleep is uh, essential for human health across the life course. Suboptimal sleep can lead to poor mental and physical health outcomes. Sleep should be considered just as important as nutrition and physical activity. Um, early life exposures appear to independently contribute to sleep in adulthood. Uh, racial disparities in suboptimal um, early life exposures and sleep health exist. Um, and you know, that has implications for the severity of disease we often see at earlier ages across a variety of outcomes. Um, early life exposures, including poor sleep, may contribute to widespread recalcitrant health disparities. Uh, racial ethnic differences and the interconnected modifiable physical as well as social environments will likely serve as effective interventions to mitigate health disparities, but addressing structural racism will uh, likely help eliminate health disparities. So I'd like to end by acknowledging my extramural collaborators. It's just a sample of them. Trainees, many are from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds who are uh, doing very well. And um, contractors from social and scientific systems now acquired by the DHL Corporation. Um, and so I'd like to thank you for your uh, time and attention. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Do we have any questions from council members um, on this interesting and provocative study uh, presentation? You can either raise your hand or if you have questions or comments, you can put them in the chat room as well. Um, Jose, I will go to you first. Um, thank you for a great presentation. I have to introduce a little 
let's say joke or something funny, but uh, this is the first uh, presentation I've seen about sleeping that actually kept me awake. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, so, thank you. And uh, uh, I, it's more a comment, uh, but uh, I think that you have the what you have, I have done is so, so great and systematic. And uh, let me say that that is similar to like what March of Dimes have been working on and addressing health disparities in preterm birth. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a very uh, subtle review that uh, likely will come out uh, in the next few months. Uh, but that intersection of uh, uh, health and uh, social determinants is exactly so determinant. So what you're uh, doing um, in using the model of, of sleep and importance of sleep is just, uh, I think, a great model that could be applied in the interaction of other uh, a conditions or other aspects that where we need to have that integration of social determinants and health. Thank you. I agree. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, Trevor. Trevor? Yeah, I'm just, uh, Chandra, great presentation, really enjoyed it. It's uh, very systematic and comprehensive. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, research related to co-exposures that might actually lead to sleep deprivation. And in particular, what comes to mind is some work that, was, that came out of our center a few years ago, which looked at uh, blood lead levels between five and 10 micrograms per deciliter, which is, you know, in that range that's just above what the CDC now recommends. And we found a, a disturbance in uh, sleep in children that were being followed longitudinally over time in the sense that they had a more wakefulness at night and increased sleep, sleepiness in the day in school uh, to the point that the wakefulness at night had to have intervention with sleeping medication. And so that's just one example, but I guess the issue that I'm raising is there could be a variety of co-exposures that, that come from issues of environmental justice, especially like lead, that could actually increase sleep deprivation and have long-term consequences. I think it's a very important area in which to do more research. Absolutely, I agree. Um, as someone who went to Hopkins for a PhD, I spent a lot of time in Baltimore, which is one area of the country uh, most affected by um, uh, lead exposure, and it's actually still a problem. Uh, but the neighborhoods that are disproportionately affected, as you've mentioned, um, are also disenfranchised in many ways, um, living in uh, almost extreme concentrated uh, poverty where um, there's neighborhood disorder related to noise, um, but poor air quality uh, that could co-occur with uh, the lead that you um, and colleagues were interested in and studying. Um, and all of them, every exposure you've mentioned does have implications for, for sleep, uh, not just in terms of the social environment, but also physiologically. We do think that chemicals could actually um, contribute to uh, disruptive sleep. And I just have to underscore because I'm such an advocate um, for the exposome approach that is being operationalized by some groups, uh, mainly in Europe, but also uh, some here in um, uh, in the U.S., um, I think it could be an unprecedented opportunity to integrate uh, the upstream and downstream um, contributors to health and health disparities. So I needed to, to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Vasquez, you have a question? Yes. I, yeah, thank you very much for an excellent talk. I learned so much. I, I really appreciate the social and environmental and exposure aspects, but me being a DNA damage and repair genetic instability person, um, I was interested about, I know there's not a lot of genes that are tied to sleep at this time. I know there are some, but I'm very interested in if people are looking at um, sort of genetic variants 
with sleep, with, with whether it be from various groups or not, male or female, but looking at the genetic mutation and then if exposure alters epigenetics of those particular genes that may be involved. I think it'd be fascinating. I mean, for example, in my family, none of the females sleep. We sleep three, four hours maybe, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So that's another question is, is eight hours or whatever is the recommended, are there genetic components or environmental components that allow some people to function completely, perfectly well on four hours of sleep? Mm -hmm. Fantastic question. Understandable that you would ask that question. And fortunately, there are a fair amount um, of researchers investigating the genetics of sleep. And in fact, I do think it's getting um, a lot of attention, certainly more than uh, the social and environmental uh, determinants. Uh, because of, of course, the traditional model. But um, if my memory serves me correctly, it's estimated that about 30% um, is the contribution of genes to your, for instance, sleep duration. Um, but a um, as I've mentioned um, at the introduction of the presentation, uh, sleep is certainly endogenously driven. Like some people have um, a strong and other people have a less strong drive uh, to sleep, um, but it's also uh, heavily influenced by exogenous factors like those environmental factors I've mentioned, light, temperature, and noise. Um, so there's undoubtedly a genetic component to sleep that is being investigated. And um, with regard to a certain segment of the population, um, innately or naturally being able to be short sleepers, that is actually um, a very low prevalence, but the belief that my family members um, are natural short sleepers who operate um, just fine is much more prevalent than um, we think the real condition happens to be. And that's because um, individuals are the more sleep deprived you are actually the less um vigilant you are and the less aware um of how vigilance can uh, dissipate so I, you would want to be formally evaluated for whether or not your family indeed um, are natural short sleepers but um, you know we sleep researchers hear it all the time um, and it's rarely um, actually the case but certainly not um, impossible for that to be the case. Um, but since I'm a sleep disparities researcher, I would also just throw in that oftentimes we have a narrative um, related to like genetics potentially contributing to the differences we see in sleep. And it may um, contribute, but we, we think um, uh, a sort of minimal amount because of the major differences in the like, social and physical uh, environment. And so if resources are limited, we would certainly advocate for the modifiable uh, environmental factors in terms of addressing sleep disparities. Uh, but I'll just end by circling back to say that there are researchers interested in um, the genetic contribution, but we do know that genes contribute to um, circadian rhythm and even sort of epigenetic um, regulation mm -hmm. to some extent, which is fascinating and has tons of um, uh, implications that hopefully researchers decide to, to pursue. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm an identical twin if you want to use me in your studies. <laughs> thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you. Um, I want to, again, draw your attention to the chat room where things are being discussed here. But Irva, you, you asked an interesting question, it also related to intergenerational and um, epigenetics. Did you want to um, ask your question out loud? Or I can read it if you'd rather. If you'd rather. Uh, sure, yeah. So Thank you. Um, I, was, uh, I was struck by um, your uh, discussion about sleep deprivation as, as a uh, you know, uh, or control, you know, a control mechanism in, uh, in slave, uh, of slaves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it made me think about what, what kind of epigenetic or intergenerational uh, impacts that sort of treatment might have had and, and, and what kind of work m maybe has been done about intergenerational effects and, and epigenetics. Um, um. 
and I had a second question too, and maybe I'll just throw it out and then I can be quiet. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it was, um, I, I was wondering about circadian rhythms over the lifespan. Um, you know, again, it's one of these family lore things that in our family, you know, well, you know, relate people. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I saw that circle of, of the circadian pattern, I, I just, it, it doesn't seem to apply to people in our family. I mean, it's, we're really shifted, we're really aberrant um, uh, in terms of temp body temperature, things I know for myself. And um, anyway, so I just wondered, are those, are those circadian disturbances, do those hold out over time? Uh, so those are the two questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for the two questions. They were fantastic and um, great sort of observation and thinking about how um, individuals who were enslaved in this country could be impacted intergenerationally from a systematic um, sort of exposure related to being made to not uh, engage in um, optimal sleep help or acquire optimal sleep help. So there's certainly, as far as I know, have not been any intergenerational studies formally conducted because it's hard enough for us to um, uh, convince researchers uh, and get participants to uh, participate in um, the the studies that lead to cross-sectional um, work and also prospective studies. Um, so I know that there are intergenerational cohorts in the U.S. Um, and abroad, but I am unfamiliar with cohorts that include sleep data and have asked these questions and certainly not in this population. However, one could um, think of post um, could think of post traumatic stress disorder and there are investigators who use animal models to um, look at the intergenerational effects among um, let's say marine <laughs> models and and health uh, but I'm not from oh, oh but there are individuals who look at post-traumatic stress disorder and sleep, especially among um, military um, individuals. And there is a pretty strong association um, that persists well over time. So if you could extrapolate what we know from um, uh, folks involved in war, might be comparable, um, then uh, we can glean information from those studies. Um, so thanks for that question, and I hope I sufficiently responded, but I just know that the, the data would be sparse. But with regard to um, circadian rhythms holding over time, so just like sleep um, recommendations, mainly in terms of duration, differ across the life course, and we think that is out of necessity. Like during um, developmental stages like infancy, you should sleep at least 12 hours a day, but that um, amount of time is reduced for adults, let's say to at least seven hours in general, although there are certainly exceptions. Um, circadian rhythms are also known to be uh, sort of less ingrained or strong um, with age. But we don't know if that's just because there's also this co-occurrence of aging and um, poor health in general that can contribute um, to that association. So I think there's um, a lot that needs to be um, investigated, but we do know that there are differences in circadian rhythm across the lifespan. Like for instance, teenagers, um, like to go to bed late and wake up in the morning. And that is not just um, for societal reasons, but um, teenagers are relatively hardwired to want to stay up later, um, go to bed later, and therefore wake up um, 
at a time that is inconsistent with um, how we traditionally make our uh, teenagers wake up to go to school. Hence, um, sleep researchers and chronobiologists playing a large role in school start times being pushed back, where we would see um, greater um, issues related to um, car accidents even, and, and it was attributed um, at least in part to um, grogginess from circadian misalignment. Um, so there are real um, physiological, but also societal uh, consequences. All right, um, thanks. I see no more hands again. There are some things on the chat room I would uh, encourage people to look at. Dr. Jackson, thank you for a great talk and thank you for the uh, great questions from council. That pretty much wraps us up for today. Um, it was a good day and I appreciate everybody being so participatory. Uh, we'll crank up again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We'll continue our discussions about uh, these topics and other things as well. So thank you very much and have a great evening.